I want to share with you all a little bit about how Radio Lex came to be. Um, I, I first want to start with the media landscape from 1983 to 2011, and that might seem a little random, but it has a lot to do with why we're here. In 1983, 90% of the media landscape was owned by more than 50 corporations. In 2011, it was down to six. And in 2021, it was down to four. So um, with, with the consolidation of media, 232 media executives in 2011 controlled the media diet of 277 million Americans. Um, News Corp owned the top newspaper on three continents, and the consolidation of local newspapers into media companies started to create news deserts. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit because it comes into play with a project that we have coming up this year. Um, when it comes to radio in 2011, Clear Channel and Cumulus terminated hundreds of, of live workers. They automated their stations in all the stations that they owned, they flipped a lot of the diverse uh, music genres to top 40. And at the end of 2011, 80% of the playlists you'd hear on any Clear Channel or Cumulus radio station were identical. And uh, as that was happening in the background, these large media corporations were arguing that small independent radio stations were interfering with their big giants signals. And so they wanted to shut down the little radio stations, but the little radio stations fought back. And in 2011, President Obama signed the Local Community Radio Act, which protected low power FM and community radio stations in the country. And that's sort of where Radio Lex enters the scene. Lexington finds its voice. So Deborah Hensley, our founder, is a former city council member. She had a nonprofit. Julie Butcher was an attorney in town, and they realized they could take this nonprofit and focus it on the creation of a community radio. And did I miss something? No. And then in 2013, the FCC opened a 30-day window for applications all across the nation. They had, I, I forget how many they had. It was not uh, maybe 1,200 licenses available for the country, and you had 30 days to apply. And um, we are ex extraordinary in the nation that we got two. We didn't just get one license, but we got two. Um, so Deborah hired Ernie Sanchez. He is one of the folks who founded NPR back in the 70s, and he's our attorney now. And then Cavill Mertz is an engineering agency, and they, they surveyed us to see what we could do in terms of radio signal, and that's what you see there. And then in 2014, Deborah started to enlist the help of community advisors to see how we could make this happen. And David was on one of the ones of the people that she reached out to way back when also Dianette, who's a, another new uh, new board member she was kind of pre-board in the past so we're glad to have them both back in the fold um but but it really was an effort to engage the community around this opportunity um there were planning meetings held with groups of people to decide okay what should a community radio station be? What should it? What should the content be? Who should it address? Who should be on the air? Then in 2014, an 18-month clock started to complete the construction of the first station. And Hap Houlihan was the general manager who was hired at the time. Doug Collins was it was and is our audio tech. He is. Um, He's built pretty much every radio station in Lexington, and he is he is a go-to resource for everybody. And um, after much searching, Deborah and the folks at BCTC came together, and we were able to install our antenna there. And that's what you see in those pictures. And then. Um, in 2015, we started to recruit the, the people who needed to be on the air because um, we were going to have a radio station. It was going to be 24-7. So what's going to be on the radio? Who's going to do it? And so we reached out um, throughout the community to find voices and folks to be on the radio station. What's happening? Okay. 
Then um, we found a place to house the radio station, and that was the STEAM Academy, which is the old Johnson Elementary building. And Lauren, I know you've been there. Melissa, you were in the basement. <laughs> I don't know, David, if you were ever in the basement or not. But um, we we settled into the STEAM Academy, and then there was a, a press outlet to um uh, you know generate a lot of press attention and um finally on september 19th in 2015 the first station went on the air we got our fcc license and wlxl 95.7 was our first station and then it was english now 95.7 is our spanish station but when it started that was the English station. And then uh, about six months or so later in 2016, uh, WLXU went on the air as our second license as the English station and El Pulso Latino, which was the Spanish station, goes on the air. And it was the first Spanish language station, FM station in the market. And for the rest of 2016, it was kind of like, let's let people know we're here. You see um, Deborah and some board members in Santa suits riding around. I think that was for the Good Giving Challenge. We did an event with HAP at Cup of Commonwealth. We got t-shirts made, and it was starting to raise awareness about what are we going to do. Um, in 2016, Chuck Clenny, who was a recent graduate of UK and had been the general manager at WRFL, was hired to help develop new programming and bring programming to the English and the Spanish station. Um, in 2017, there was an increase in volunteers, new shows. There's Rowena and Ben and Food Justice Radio there at the bottom. You can see Weta Michael had a show and Rona Roberts. Um, and Lexington community started to catch on and, and people started to listen and it became uh, started to become a, a community source of information. Um, it, it, towards the end of 2017, uh, Chuck decided that he was going to move to Japan to teach English, and he stepped down. And I had been doing some consulting on the nonprofit side of things, and the board asked if I would or you know, consider coming on, and I did. And um, then I, in the fall, was able to hire Victor Palomino from Asheville, North Carolina, and then Mary Clark was already on board as our program director, and um, she is now the, um, she's the sort of faculty advisor of RFL at UK. So we have a very close relationship with WRFL, which is UK student station. And um, it's it's great to enjoy that relationship. Um, 2018, we really focused on growing relationships with strategic community partners. You'll see there we have Mayor Gray, uh, Rufus Friday and Peter Baniak from the Herald Leader, Kevin Hall from the Health Department, Divine Kurama, and Milton Mesa, who is uh, a recruiter for BCTC, and, and he is part of the Dreamers Coalition, an initiative of students who are dreamers. And in 2018, we created a three-year strategic plan, which ended last year. So part of what you're going to be doing going forward is helping us with our new strategic plan. Um, in 2018, we converted from a desktop software that was built into one machine that lived in the basement of Steam to um, a web-based software, which allows us to operate the station anywhere, and that will become important in the future. So we also started to engage, as much as we were trying to attract people to us, we started to reach out to people in the community. In 2018, there was a hootenanny at Smiley Pete with Michael Shannon, the actor. He was in town with his band, and it was uh, it, there were lots of local politicians there, local candidates, and it was a meet and greet, and so we were involved in that. We did a Summer Sounds concert series. We collaborated with La Casa de Cultura on the Festival Latina and Mother's Day ceremonies and all kinds of things. So we really worked to get out in the community. In 2019, wait, did I skip 20? Yeah, 2019, the um, more volunteers uh, come on board. We grow more relationships and we start doing with younger kids, we start doing partnerships about podcasting. So we work with Sayer, Carnegie Center, 4-H, 
And we would have a workshop that was a week long. We would teach kids how to structure an episode or a, a show of a podcast. They would research, record, and then we would do a special and play them on the air. And, and that became a, a great model for us to work with. And then in September of 2019, we hosted On Common Ground, which you heard Juan mention in his video introduction. This was a public conversation about immigration, identity, and how we define community. Immigration was in the headlines that was um, in the height of the, the border wall controversy, the children in cages, all that was happening, and it, it was impacting our life here. And so we were able to, um, because of a relationship with Define American, get Jose Antonio Vargas, who was a former um, editor at the Washington Post, and then he sort of came out and became the the country's most famous undocumented person. He came, we hosted an event that was in the Kentucky Theater, and it was a huge success and really kind of helped us shape our mission going forward. Um, at the very end of 2019, we at, with all the attention on us from On Common Ground, we rebranded ourselves and became Radio Lex, the voice of the people. And the reason we became Radio Lex is that it is bilingual. You don't have to translate it into English or Spanish. It's it's the same. And we wanted to really unify our two stations. We wanted to be a bilingual entity. We didn't want to have a Spanish half and a English half that were segregated. We, we really wanted to be a, a joint organization. Um, then in 2020, of course, COVID showed up and um, in, in, when COVID hit, we suddenly realized that there was, there was not adequate infrastructure to communicate this very critical public safety information to people who didn't speak Spanish. So we collaborated with the mayor's office, the governor's office, the health department, and among all of these folks, we got together and very quickly um, created a system by which the governor would come on, he would do his little daily spiel, his team would write a, a press release I would get that press release early in the evening. I would condense it for broadcast. I would then send it out to 20 or 30 volunteer translators who would um, translate the written thing and record it in 15 or 20 different languages, send it back to Victor before 8 a.m. the next morning so that he could produce it and have it on the air by nine. And so that way we ensured every day in and out that there was timely information about COVID going out to everybody who needed it in their first language, because that's a very important thing. Um, and it was such a successful model that later in 2020, the U.S. Census enlisted our help and we received some money to help uh, reach hard to reach uh, folks, communities in Lexington. And our census response in Fayette County was one of the highest in the country. And we got an official commendation from the US Census Office for our help. Um, okay. All right, and then at the very, very, very end of 2020, we left the STEAM Academy and got ready to move to our new location in the Gray Line. Um, and if you haven't been to the Gray Line Station and Market, I certainly invite you to attend. Um, we moved in at the beginning of 2021, opened our doors. It's a really fun space, so much different from the basements. Um, and I'll show you a, a little video um, shortly of, of kind of a walkthrough. But that was a lot of work. And luckily, it was in the, the middle of COVID. So Victor and I kind of worked in the, in the station and painted and got everything together. And um, we, we opened our doors probably in February of 2021. And then um, again, with the multilingual work around COVID, we, we worked with the city and um, the, the public education campaigns around vaccinations. And so you see an image there of Victor getting his vaccine. 
that was on social media. Very important to to be seen doing that. Um, and then we received recommend recognition from the governor. So you see at the bottom there, we were invited to the Capitol. We stood in the little room where the governor did his speech every day, and we got an official proclamation. So that after all of the work that we did, that was that was that felt really good. Um, so looking forward, we are now in 2022. You are here. Welcome. We arrived. Um, going forward, we're going to be looking at a community newsroom project, which is going to take our multilingual outreach and, and train everyday folks in the community to be citizen reporters who can report culturally competent news from their perspective targeted to their communities. Um, then the Kentucky Podcast Network, we're going to try to create an index, a clearinghouse of all local Kentucky podcasters. So there's kind of a one-stop shop to find the, the podcast here in Kentucky. We are going to hopefully develop our mobile app so that it's a little more engaging right now. It's pretty low frills. And then you all will be involved in uh, developing our new strategic plan. This year, we'll do a strategic plan, and that'll be for the, the future. And then we are also in the process of hiring new staff. At the end of the year, Victor left us. We have hired Jacobo um, Aragon Torres, uh, who you may or may not know. He's a retired uh, Spanish teacher from Lexington Catholic in the Lexington School. He is um, a, a musician, a percussionist, an artist, and he is starting as our volunteer coordinator. I met with him today. And he's going to be a great asset to the organization. I'm very excited that he is here. So, and there will be a lot more. And that is the that is the um, the quick down and dirty history of Radio Lex. Is that